Our next guest this evening is Colonel Mike Farrar. And uh, Colonel is uh, retired from the United States Air Force's Air Weather Service. And he's a, a really unique guest with us this evening because he actually began his career as a cadet in the Civil Air Patrol. Colonel, thanks so much for joining us this evening. And, and if you could start out by just describing your career in weather and where that came from and your inspiration, please, sir. Sure. Uh, as happy to be with you tonight. Uh, uh, my start in, uh, with the military, like you mentioned, uh, was with the Civil Air Patrol. Uh, I was a cadet uh, at the Barry Field Cadet Squadron uh, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, back in the very late 70s, early 80s. Uh, from there, I went on to be, uh, I was fortunate enough to get an ROTC scholarship in physics at Purdue University, and uh, did that for four years. And uh, to my surprise, uh, uh, as my senior year, I got uh, notified that my assignment had come in, and I was notified that I was going to be a meteorologist. So my first question was, what is that? So it turns out that uh, uh, there was a need, a critical need for meteorologists at that time, and they were, uh, and typically they would go to those who had, had majors in the hard sciences, you know, physics, math, uh, chemistry, that kind of thing. Uh, and we went, so and we would go back and do more schooling for, for meteorology and weather, which is what I did. Uh, and after that, uh, I started off as a second lieutenant in the Air Force um, at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. Uh, I got there in 1987, and uh, the Cold War was still on, uh, and I was uh, there at Ramstein as a weather forecaster and a weather briefer at the U.S. Air Forces in Europe headquarters. Uh, after that, I went back to, uh, to school, to graduate school, and uh, to do, get a master's in meteorology. And uh, while there, I uh, was able to watch on TV as the Berlin Wall fell, a place that I just visited a few months before in, in 1989. So that was a, a big development. Uh, uh, and from there, and uh, after I finished graduate school, I went to uh, what was then called the Air Force Global Weather Center in, in uh, Omaha, uh, as well as SAC headquarters, uh, which is Strategic Air Command. Uh, and at that time, uh, SAC was closing down, and so I moved across the base to the Global Weather Center where I worked uh, in satellite meteorology as well as program management. Uh, then I was fortunate enough to be selected to go to school again for my PhD, went back to Florida State. Uh, and then after that, um, after I got my PhD, I went to Kunsan Air Base Korea, where I was the weather officer of supporting two F-16 squadrons. Uh, and that was a really great assignment. I was there alone. That was what was called a remote assignment. You had to leave your family behind. Uh, did that for a year, and then I went back to Omaha, uh, this time it was called the Air Force Weather Agency, and there I worked as the head of what's called the models, uh, meteorological models branch, and uh, that was all the computer models of the atmosphere that helps drive the forecast for around the world for the Air Force. I was fortunate to do that for a couple of years, and before I moved on to be the chief of the training division, where I worked on all the training uh, for all the things that happened, uh, all the weather training for all the, the, the career field across the Air Force. Uh, at that point, I went to the Pentagon uh, and uh, got there in the summer of 2001, where I was working on uh, ally, working with allies and joint partners with the Navy. And shortly after I got there, uh, and a, cu a couple months later, it was uh, September, um, and I was sitting out in front of the Pentagon one morning on my way back to my office, uh, uh, another uh, another office really close to the Pentagon, when uh, I was unfortunate enough to see. Uh, the uh, plane crash into the Pentagon, which was in that, the morning was September 11th. And so I was involved along with all the other folks at the Pentagon that day and for the next few years later uh, working in the response. Uh, after I finished up with the, the Allied and Allied support for a year, I moved over to, to work be as a budget monitor where I helped manage the $100, $100 million a year weather budget for the Air Force. From there, I was fortunate enough to get my command tour. By that time, I was a lieutenant colonel. I went to Japan, where I was the weather squadron commander, where we did all the forecasting for East Asia and the West Pacific. Uh, that was a fantastic assignment, in addition to being a commander uh, and getting to work with new troops, both enlisted and uh, officer. Uh, I was also helping represent our country over with our uh, partners in Japan and our allies there. Uh, after that, I, I was 
went to weather went went to a non weather excuse me professional military school back in D.C. and then I moved on to be something. Then I got promoted to colonel, uh, and from there I actually did my last assignment in the Air Force, but it was not a weather job. It was working as a re research and development manager for what's the, called the Defense Threat Reduction Agency um, that uh, works on, on counter weapons of mass destruction technology. So we helped work with the former Soviet Un Union countries get rid of their weapons of mass destruction, uh, as well as worked on technologies to detect it uh, and to counter its effects. That was a really fun job. Um, and then I ended up retiring from the Air Force in 2010 after almost 25 years uh, in the service, but and when I both when I retired uh, uh, and when I got promoted to colonel, I made a very good point of uh, of noting my roots and knowing that where I started was necessarily in ROTC, but it was uh, I started as a cadet in the Civil Air Patrol. Colonel, thanks so much for sharing that wonderful story. A lot of our audience this evening has asked the question, what kind of an academic background do I need to have in order to have a weather career in the Air Force? Sure. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in, in being a meteorologist in the Air Force, um, it's, uh, you know, the impression I had when I was, uh, when I was a kid, uh, or even as a lot of adults have, that are close to it is you see the guy on TV, uh, you know, reading the forecast, uh, um, being a, a broadcaster, and that is a small subset of, of the career field, but for the most part what you need is what you need for being any kind of scientific career field. That's really strong in science and math, uh, because meteorology uh, and, and its application to weather forecasting is in its true nature, it's a scientific endeavor, so it's really more of a, a science, uh, science type of field. Do you uh, think that a, a degree in weather is important or do any science or uh, perhaps a computer science degree, are they more important for somebody looking forward to being commissioned in the Air Force and uh, coming into the weather career field? Well, um, it all depends um, kind of on what the Air Force needs at the time. Um, just like anything else, uh, whether it's weather or uh, when I, where I started in physics or any other or engineering or no matter what it depends on what the Air Force's uh, needs are uh, but if you if you really want to be a meteorologist the best way to start off is, is with the physical sciences so that's either physics uh, oceanography uh, that kind of thing uh, and certainly meteorology is the obvious choice uh, and then sometimes if the, if the Air Force needs more meteorologists then then they, uh, then they have available, then they will do what they did with me, which is reach out and take some new young officer uh, and, 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 and introduce him right away into weather. Now, if you don't want to, if you're not really uh, going to college and you are wanting to come in as an enlisted troop, uh, the same thing sort of applies. You don't come in with a degree, but uh, you really, they, they really look for people who are strong in the math and science. And then if you're enlisted, what they would do is they would take you and send you to forecast your school. And there, it's a really intensive training program that lasts several months. And out of that, you come out with uh, the ability to do some uh, forecasts, and you would go on to your first assignment where uh, you'd be mentored and uh, get additional on-the-job training. So that's, that's kind of two paths into the weather career field. I came in through the officer side with a degree, but uh, uh, weather is one of the really, really exciting career fields to get into as an enlisted troop because uh, you get a lot of really intense uh, training education. Uh, as I listen to your story and uh, listen to your, uh, all the years in the Air Force that you had, I lost count. How much of that time was actually spent really forecasting the weather? That's a good question. Um, for me as, a, as an officer, uh, I would say maybe you know, less than a quarter of my career was actually weather forecasting. Because when you go into the, the, the Air Force as an officer, your specialty is secondary. What you're really going in to do is to be a leader. Uh, and so there you will, especially early in your career, you will spend a lot more time with your professional or discipline, in my case was weather, meteorology. But uh, the, the more you go along, you, are immediate, you really quickly get pushed into the management and leadership jobs. And there you're not really doing the hands-on of the weather forecasting, but you're managing others that do. 
If you take the uh, if you take the enlisted track, however, you will be spending a much greater percentage of your career actually doing the forecasting. Great. I understand now that you're with the National Weather Service. What are you doing there now, sir? Sure. Uh, well, after I retired from the Air Force, I worked in the private sector for a couple of years, uh, and then after that, I did uh, I joined the Weather Service, the National Weather Service. Uh, my first job was. Uh, is in the program management section where I helped oversee the acquisition of uh, weather systems as well as uh, information technology or computer systems that helped you know do the, the, the number crunching uh, or the data manipulation that helped support the forecasters. I did that for about a year and a half and then about six months ago I was recently promoted to be a lab director and in this new job uh, I am uh, I'm a director of a lab of about 60 people, uh, primarily federal civil servants, but also uh, some contract company, you know, private companies that so, that augment us, and we develop uh, tools and applications and techniques that are used by the operational weather forecasters of the National Weather Service, which are scattered across 122 local offices uh, across the United States. Great. What would you say uh, to someone who really wants to come in and work with the weather? Should they look at the Air Force as a career, or should they look at the National Weather Service directly as a as a as a career path? What would you recommend from your experience in both of those worlds? Well, I mean, each each are equally viable. Um, if you have an interest in um, really, I would say, seeing the world. Uh, you know, doing meteorology, uh, supporting uh, meteorological operations, not only across the world, but in a wide variety of applications. Uh, and, you know, maybe the Air Force is for you. But if you are truly just uh, purely focused on forecasting and meteorology, and you are what some people call a weather geek, um, then maybe the National Weather Service might be, might just want to go straight there. Uh, the National Weather Service Unlike the Air Force, where you can have an enlisted person come in with a high school diploma, still strong in math and science, and get their training that they need to be a forecaster, uh, the National Weather Service is a very different model. Their forecasters are all degreed meteorologists, and so a minimum of, of a bachelor's degree, and, and many of them have master's and even PhDs. Uh, so uh, it's a very different way of doing weather support uh, in the National Weather Service. So. Each are equally viable. It just kind of depends on what your priorities and interests are. Great. Colonel, thanks so much for being with us. Our final question this evening is, is one only you can answer because you're the only former cadet on this uh, program this evening. What were the lessons that you learned as a Civil Air Patrol cadet that you've now carried forward into a full career in the Air Force? What were the most important things to you? Well, uh, the Civil Air Patrol was very formative for my early career, uh, whereas I had played on many sports teams, for instance, and learned the value of teamwork from that perspective, it was really a lot more uh, in-depth and uh, focused on uh, teamwork on focus on national service with, with the Civil Air Patrol. Uh, even though we weren't part of the armed services, I mean, no one gave us a gun, haha, uh, we were obviously an auxiliary to the United States Air Force. and that was instilled in us as public service uh, to the country. Uh, so in addition to teamwork and public service, it, it also gave me a great exposure into the Air Force and the military. Uh, I got lots of training opportunities. I did a, a survival training uh, school uh, at the Air Force Academy when I was, I think, 16 years old. And so I got to, uh, I got to, uh, to learn, so went to a survival school that was taught by real Air Force survival instructors, the same ones that trained the pilots in case they get shot down by an enemy line. So I got a really close-up view of the Air Force. Uh, one of my field training encampments with Civil Air Patrol uh, was at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which is on the Tennessee-Kentucky border. Of course, that's an Army installation, and we got to uh, got exposed to a lot of the uh, Army way of life there as well. And so Civil Air Patrol was, it gave me a lot of inroads into learning what the military is about. Uh, and again, like I mentioned at the beginning, it was very uh, instructive uh, and informative and, and really in teamwork and service to your country. 
I noticed that your uh, story is actually featured in the volunteer magazine of the Civil Air Patrol back from uh, the spring of uh, 2008. And as I read your story, I was interested to see your own father was uh, became a senior member uh, of the Civil Air Patrol. How was it for all the cadets out there that who whose parents also joined them in Civil Air Patrol? How did you feel about having your your father be part of the, your own youth program? Well, it, it, I really liked it a lot. Uh, my dad, like you, uh, joined as a chaplain. Uh, so at, at the time, uh, he, uh, he was his main career was as an engineer, but he also uh, on the side was an ordained minister, and and uh, that was really a lot of fun uh, getting to do that with my dad. He didn't do it the entire time I was in. I think he joined about a year or so after I did. Uh, when he saw how much fun I was having, uh, it really spoke to him and. Uh, so yeah, it was it was great fun. Uh, I've kind of my my sons did not choose to do Civil Air Patrol, but they did the Boy Scouts, and so it was a very similar experience uh, as those of your your uh, Civil Air Patrol cadets who might also be Boy Scouts. Uh, they also have uh, adult leaders there, so it was a very similar experience. Great, Colonel. Thanks so very much for taking the time this evening to join us on on this call and talk about weather as a career field. Uh, it's sure been a wonderful opportunity and. Hey, thanks so much for sharing your story back in 2008 and actually this past week for being uh, one of our uh, cadets who aimed high and uh, we featured of course your picture uh, of you as a cadet airman and then of course your uh, you as a colonel in the United States Air Force side by side and that uh, as we say in the social media world that picture went viral uh, amongst all our uh, seniors and adults. Uh, out there. But thanks again for being part of our show this evening and for sharing your life experience and thanks for your service to the country both in the Civil Air Patrol and in the United States Air Force. Sure is our privilege to have you this evening, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it.